All right, we are going to start. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we have a full agenda. I'll try to keep, uh, Jeremy, I'll try to keep an eye on the waiting room, but if I miss it, will you uh, grab somebody? Um, there are a couple things I have to report. Uh, I'm not going to do a slideshow or anything, I, but I've gotten a couple of communications that um, I would like to report to the club. Um, the first is uh, we have been asked about a, an astronomy event on that's April 27th at Laurel Hill Cemetery. Um, they're doing a public star party. They think they'll have about 25 people from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., uh, weather permitting, and um, they would like to set up extra telescopes. Now, I, war I said to the person who was soliciting us that we're not, uh, not all of us are comfortable with other people looking through our scopes yet, but I will inquire. <coughs> and if, bless you, if anybody is interested, um, please contact me um, off the list. Um, and, and the email is easy, president at dvaa.org, and I'll put you together with this person who's, uh, who's doing the April 27th event. The uh, second thing I was asked about is there is a 50 plus community, and we actually talked about this at the board, I think in December or earlier, um, and they like to provide computer access uh, and reduce social isolation for the people who are in their community. And uh, they'd like to have club events. They're trying to look for club events for their members. Um, at first, they were talking about um, some sort of introductory membership. And I said, that's really not necessary because our general meetings where we do presentations are streamed to YouTube. And if they have a computer handy, they can watch anything they want. We don't we don't discriminate. Um, so, uh, but they apparently have their own platform website where they showcase the club and members sign up for it. So um, what I may do is give them information regarding our website, let them plug into our website, but encourage them by following the website, they can see when our meetings are and they can tune in on uh, YouTube since they won't get the Zoom chat link unless they're in the club. But if anybody's interested in helping out with that, let me know. Um, the last thing I want to report from outside communications is Alcon will be virtual. And uh, our board will talk about it. But we've been asked by the president of the Astronomical League to offer up a door prize for them to help raise funds because they're doing a virtual instead of a live uh, conference. And they're looking for something in the 150 to 200 dollar range. But if somebody's interested in helping out with that, let me know. Otherwise, the board will talk about what we can do in that regard. Maybe there's something left over from uh, the auction that didn't go that we can we well, can put up. For I'd that. be happy to chip in. Okay, great, Lewis. Thanks. I'll I'll follow up with you. Um, uh, let's see. The last thing I wanted to mention, or two things I wanted to mention, uh, Bob Treblecock's on. Uh, he and I are in the Delaware Astronomical Society Book Club. The book we're reading for next Thursday's, Wednesday or Thursday's meeting is uh, Professor Avi Loeb's Extraterrestrial, The First Proof of Life Beyond Planet Earth. Um, a topic which we're actually going to be talking about tonight with a different guest and which ignited a little bit of a, uh, the closest thing we've had to a flame war on our listserv in a while. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, Loeb's approach is, I think, interesting and completely defensible. And um, uh, Richard's not here to defend himself, but not the same thing as cold fusion in my estimation. Um, but uh, if you're interested, I know um, one or two of you have sent me emails and I've sent your link along to uh, the DAS uh, people and uh, love to see you another night during the month uh, at the book club meetings. Last thing I'll mention is um, there's no, uh, what is it, uh, main sequence star party planned for the summer. Uh, as I think I mentioned last month, um, Cherry Spring State Park is going ahead with its wood, Woodsman's Festival, and astronomers are not allowed on the field until the Tuesday after that festival. Uh, and of course, the festival is during the new moon. Um, I don't know who the, bril the brilliant person was who set that up, but they did. Um, so 
uh, Chester, Chester, the, the Chesco Club is going to go up August 10th to August 13th, and we're invited to join them. Uh, the rain date or cloud date, as it were, is September 7th to September 10th. So check your calendars if you're interested in going up to Cherry Springs with a group. Those are the times when uh, folks will be going up. I'm going to try and get up there. I just haven't figured out when I'm going to do it or how. Um, and that is all I have to report. Um, so... We're going to move to our usual committee reports. And then just before Andrew speaks, we have a special guest to, to, to speak to us from the Rotary Club. So, Brian, you're up. Okay. We, uh, this month, we have uh, three new members, uh, Thomas Hickey, uh, Craig Attic, and uh, Vinoba uh, Panner Sylvan. Um, hope I didn't butcher that name too bad. Um, well, yeah, like I said, three three members this month. It's slowed down a little bit, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's we're so we're, we'll start we'll start we're still bringing them in. So that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Thank you. Uh, and I'm continuing to try and reach out to all the new members. That's excellent. But three new members a month is is still close to forty new members every year, and that's great. Um, Lewis. Yeah, I don't really have very much to say other than uh, we're in the middle of the year. If anyone has not paid their uh, dues, uh, please do. You can always tell by going to the website and seeing next to your name when you log in. It will say a dollar sign if, if you owe money. We're not going to ch ch uh, chase you guys down, but it is very much a help, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Lewis, one thing that's been on, been on my to-do list, we need to link up the checking account with the Vanguard account. Yes. Yes. And so, uh, so I'd be very happy to do it, but it's in your hands, right? It's, all right. Uh, I'll get you the forms. I'll take okay. care of that and get you the forms. Great. Um, okay. Um, Janet. Hi, I'm Janet Rush. I'm outreach chair in Veep. And we do have an event coming up this month uh, for, for outreach. And unfortunately, Howard, it's the same day as the request that you got. It's on the 27th. Mm -hmm. And it's been on the calendar for, for a while. Uh, I think the usual crew will be there with the projection format. It's at uh, in Upper Providence at the Anderson Farm Park. Um, and the registration is being handled by, um, by Upper Providence Parks and Rec. But if you uh, click on the event on our page, you can get to their registration form. And I don't know, it's, it's not available to check to see whether it's filled or not yet. But um, all the usual suspects will be engaged in that event on the 27th. So I don't know if you're gonna find anyone to do the other event. Okay, <laughs> I'll report back to her, but thanks, Janet. And that's all we have set up right now? That's all we have. Well, we have uh, one in um, June, but I, that's enough to talk about now. Yep, okay. Sounds great. Um, Lewis, you want to introduce Darlene and we'll take it, we'll, we'll hear what you guys have to tell us about Rotary. Don't forget uh, to unmute yourself, Lewis. Uh, Lewis. Oh, Lou, sorry. I'm sorry. Lou, Lou. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, I went to- I'm here, well. sorry. I just didn't want to make noise and interrupt. So Darlene Scott is joining us from the Rotary Club. She's going to uh, uh, present us with an initiative. They started already, it's already in motion. For a common aid, uh, partnership with the SETI Institute. Um, uh, actually, I'll let her explain. She could do it much better than me because I'm still learning about it, but I think it's really exciting and a perfect fit for the club. Take it away, Darlene. Hi, Lou. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for letting me impose in on your, um, your meeting. My name is Darlene Scott. As Lou said, I am um, Upper Perk Rotarian. And I've been in the Rotary for 10 years, and I am the District Youth Services Chair. I've, I've served as District Youth Services Chair three years. This opportunity came up to us in September. We've been working on the, um, the initiative, and we're at a stage in the initiative that we will need uh, volunteers. Uh, we're trying to, I wrote a little bit down here, we're from October to November, we fleshed out the ideas, we reviewed local programs, and we began our journey with SETI Institute. In mid in mid November, the STEM Youth Explorer Academy with the Space and Astronomy 
was, was our entry point. We wanted to get our students involved and we wanted to get them excited about science because what we were looking at and what we were, were discovering as we were doing our brainstorming was we realized that some of our future careers that our students would have, they wouldn't be able to get into these, these, uh, these, these programs if they didn't have an interest in science and in STEMI and SETI. So we, we collaborated with SETI and Albright College, their Science Research in Institute. And uh, they are opening up the, uh, the college for us and they already have the labs all there. And we just need volunteers. When we, when we have this camp next year, we need people I'm passionate about youth. I'm passionate about youth programs. I can sell a program, but we need passionate people that can sell space. And that's where you come in. And I, whether you help us with a workshop or you help us with a star party or you, you help us with, with whatever, you know, when I was listening earlier to Scott and I, I was amazed at just how he can put things together and he showed us his telescope in his in his room and it's just something that I could never do. So we need people like you. I can I can sell it. I can I can have someone from our rotary communications team because yes we do have a communications team. We have a curriculum team. We have we have a, it's just crazy how this has three legs and we're ready to run. And we, we would love for you to partner with us. Uh, we would love for you to get excited with us. And um, yeah, if you wanted to have a presentation, I'll be happy to have a presentation set up for your club. They do a much better job than I do. I just know I'm crazy about anything for youth. And this is something that we can offer seventh graders. Uh, we never had a program that we offered to seventh graders before. We've always mm -hmm. um, done programs that were for junior high. We have, um, we have a close knit uh, group in the high school that we do youth exchange programs with for peace and understanding and in, through immersion. We have interact clubs, which are junior Rotarians, but we never had anything that was science related or space related. So I hope tonight that you enjoy listening to SETI representative as well as, as much as we've learned so much about SETI and they are partnering with us. They are writing the curriculum and it is a scalable project. We're hoping to bring it not only to our district but we're hoping to bring it to Rot Rotarians around the world. So, you know, if you are interested in being a part of this, this pilot program, we're hoping to have 100 seventh graders that are um, underserved, underserved in the communities that will be mm -hmm. sponsored by our Rotary Clubs. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that each Rotary Club, we have 47 clubs in our district, will sponsor two students. Each year we're going to do this yearly and it will hopefully be a sustainable project. We've raised over $30,000 in just one, one month just to write the curriculum. So it is moving and we would love for you to hop on board with us. The end. Thank you, Darlene, that sounds very exciting. I'm sure you'll get a lot of people uh, that want to participate. Yeah, if, if you are interested, please reach out to Lou. He'll be happy to get, um, he'll be happy to get in touch with me. Uh, if you're interested in curricular, cur writing the curriculum, <laughs> <laughs> curriculum. If you're interested in helping with that, uh, if you're interested in helping, whatever. I mean, if you just want to volunteer for the day, um, we're, we're going to need people that know stuff about science. Uh, I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm the coordinator. I'll make sure that everyone gets to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what I, that's what I'm good at, but thank you again for inviting me to the meeting and, and letting me impose on your time. I, I so appreciate it. And I, I look forward to hopefully working with some of you in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and if you don't mind, it. I want to stay on just for a little. Please, please, please do. Please do. Please and do. afterwards. <laughs> yeah, stay on. The, the best part is after the meeting. Yep. Um, 
Andrew, I know you have a report this month and it's starting to get close to warm enough that I even go out. <laughs> All right, yes, I do. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Oh, Jeremy, can you enable me? It says the host is disabled. Oh. Share, screen share. There okay. we go. Be good. Thank you. So, can everyone see that? Yes, I can. Great. Minimize, hide all of you. All right. Uh, Welcome everyone, my name is Andrew Hitchner. I'm the observing chair for the DVA and uh, this is my observing report for April, 2021. And uh, it's it's gonna be a little different, uh, don't worry, it'd still be um, applicable to visual observing, but it's something that I find really interesting um, all about like measuring uh, light and stars and how we communicate about how bright stars are. Um, of course, talk about the magnitude system. So I'm gonna talk a bit about um, a, a certain satellite out there, a mission, uh, and that's the Gaia mission. So uh, some of you might not have heard of this. This is a total uh, ESA mission, European Space Agency. Uh, they built the satellite, they fly the satellite, and to my knowledge, they're the ones doing all the data processing too. So of course, we don't have a lot of people from the ESA come and talk here for obvious reasons. Uh, so maybe you haven't heard about it, uh, but it's actually a really fascinating project uh, that's going on. And it might actually influence how, uh, even at the amateur level, how we talk about um, how bright things are, visual magnitude. So I'll give a brief overview of the magnitude system. Won't go into details. Uh, that's for another talk. And then I'll give a brief overview of the Gaia mission and what it's trying to accomplish. And then also how that might um, influence this idea of a standardized magnitude system. So we go outside and, and we talk about stars and the visual magnitude of the star all the time. So what is that? Um, and it's just a system to define the brightness of a celestial object. And everyone knows of it as it as like the backward scale, right? A negative scale. Higher numbers are dimmer. So a magnitude 10 star is going to be dimmer than a magnitude 3 star. And that's just uh, the way that it was designed. Uh, and it's also relative scale, though. Most people don't realize um, that it's relative to other stars. So when it was defined, Vega was chosen as the zero magnitude star. And all stars were compared to the brightness of Vega and then were given their magnitude. And you can see that in this equation down here. I'm not going to linger on it, but I just wanted to point out there's this negative sign here. So that makes it negative. Uh, it's logarithmic uh, be for multiple reasons. One being that our eyes are sort of logarithmic detectors. And here you need to know the flux of your star and then you compare that to the flux of this zero point star. Flux is just a fancy way of saying how much light is coming from the star. But I just wanted to drive home the fact that it really depends. It's just a relative scale. And you can pick any zero point here. Uh, it doesn't have to be Vega. It doesn't have to, it can be whatever you want. Uh, and then that is in another magnitude system. But of course, we usually refer to it as Vega. Uh, when somebody says visual magnitude, they're just usually talking about in our community, the amateur community as the Vega scale and they're defining specifically in the uh, wavelength range of our eye, the visible wavelength range. And there's some problems with this. Um, one is that Vega is not always visible, if at all. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, you can't see Vega, right? So how can they really compare other stars' brightnesses to Vega? Uh, Vega has been found to be possibly variable in the uh, in the visible wavelengths. So how can you compare star brightnesses when your own standard Vega is changing sometimes? And it's not suitable for infrared measurements. As astronomy evolves, we're doing more and more research. Uh, as I have in a later bullet point there, we're doing more and more research in more and more wavelengths. And we need to define some standard way of relating infrared measurements to visible wave measurements and so on. Uh, it turns out that Vega has this kind of dust disk around it, which really inhibits and changes the uh, amount of infrared light coming from it. So it's not suitable for that. 
So given all these challenges, uh, astronomers redefined the zero point uh, to be a standard flux. You just, just, they just picked a number and that is the standard flux. And if you use this number uh, and compare it to the flux that you get from Vega, that turn makes Vega at about 0 0.026, so a little bit uh, dimmer than zero magnitude. Now you might be saying, oh, 0 0.026, what is that? It's like, well, when you're trying to do uh, really precise astronomy measurements and stuff, that's actually a, a considerable difference there. But for us, of course, when we're just describing things, it's not too much of a difference. Uh, but there's obviously room for improvement here uh, with a relative system. And really there's room for improvement of standardizing this system all around the sky for all wavelengths and for all different types of stars. Uh, and that's where Gaia comes in. So the main goal of Gaia, and I took this right from, from the website, which I've linked down later on in the presentation, but I'll just read it. The main goal of Gaia mission is to make the largest, most precise three-dimensional map of our galaxy by sur surveying an unprecedented 1% of the galaxy's population of 100 billion stars. So that's a billion stars that this is going to survey. Uh, and a few other bullet points there was study the motion of stars. And then if you know how the stars are moving, you can re rewind, if you say, to the formation of the galaxy. Uh, it will observe all of those billion stars over 70 times in the lifespan of five years. So you're going to get all these kind of variable stars. Uh, you can see if stars magnitude changes, maybe there's a planet going around the stars. Uh, it's gonna create a 3D map of the galaxy, as it mentioned. And you can see a lot of potential here uh, with all of the data that it's observing. And what I'm going to talk about is that it all leads to an unprecedented catalog of accurate stellar motion and photometric measurements that's really going to define how we talk about stars in the future. So a little bit about the satellite itself. Uh, it launched in 19th of December 2013. Its mission life was for five years, but it's still going strong. Uh, is in the L2 Lagrange orbit. And if that sounds familiar, that's the same orbit as the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, what makes it really great is that it has an unobstructed eclipse-free view of the entire celestial sphere. So these 1 billion stars that it's measuring is spread out across the entire sky. It's not in one uh, localized region or so like the Kepler mission was. Uh, it has two telescopes that share a common focal plane, or that's a fancy word for CCD camera. And on it has three instruments, one dedicated to astrometry, so motion of stars, one designated to broadband photometry or over the entire visible uh, wavelength range, and then also one due to spectro or designated to spectrometry, uh, which is like photometry, but instead of a really broad source, it's looking at particular wavelengths or so. So here's a great illustration of it uh, and how it is. So basically the satellite itself is just this disc kind of this top and it, it's just spinning, rotating around and then it's rotating around um, with the earth as well. So you can kind of picture and it shows how the telescope entrances sweep large swaths around the celestial sphere. And I couldn't find a great picture, but if you could imagine these two beams coming down here and then the camera looking up, and then this cyan beam comes down on the one half of the camera and then the magenta beam comes down on the other half of the camera. So it's, it's pretty cool technology how they can do the sort of a uh, hardware bookkeeping, if you will, of this side of the array is looking at this cyan beam and this side is looking at the magenta beam. Uh, but the different instruments are situated so that uh, One's looking at one telescope and one's looking in the other telescope and eventually this, the magenta beam will come around and look over the same region that the cyan beam did. But it's really just a spinning top out there, uh, really far away from the Earth in that special orbit where it can observe the entire sky. A uh, little bit about the data, because as you can see, this is a ton of data and it's being released in segments. Uh, this really large, you can't really process it all at one time. Um, not, and it's also not recording all at one time, of course. Uh, and there's a lot of advantages to this. One is that they can integrate improvements into new and also previous releases. So uh, in between data release one and two, they found out that they didn't really model the, the throughput 
of the optics correctly. So they were able to back that into data release one and re-release that, and then also release data release two uh, with those improvements. So they so that you didn't need to rerun it through the entire data is what I'm saying, save them a lot of time. And it's a little timely. Uh, I saw that they're currently on early data release three, uh, which happened in December, 2020. The full data set is going to be release, released in 2022. And this is all publicly available if you were so inclined to download this yourself. Uh, it's all out there. All of the stars that Gaia measured are free, free to download. So why do you care? What does this mean to you? Well, it's going to have a big impact on visual magnitude, as I said. So Gaia has three filters. Uh, it has a broadband filter, or it covers all of the visible range. And then it has two narrow bands. I, I put narrow in quotes because it's still a considerable wavelength range. It's not one or two uh, nanometers or so, but, but it's more narrow than the broadband source. And it has its own magnitude system with these bands. They're called Gaia mags. And if you download the data, you'll see that there's the, uh, the G Gaia mag, the R Gaia mag, and I think the B R, R Gaia mag. And this is important because it offers a full sky, highly accurate photometric measurements. And it offers an opportunity for a truly standardized magnitude system because it's observing 1 billion stars 70 times over the course of now more than five years, so more than 70 times now. So it's going to be a great way for astronomers to um, pick out standard stars, uh, learn about how stars change over time, uh, and what stars we can use as this standard candle, you might have heard, or this zero point, uh, to make a really easily relatable magnitude scale for everyone to use all over the world for a long period of time. Uh, and then it's, it's a really easy way uh, to convert Gaia magnitude to other systems. Uh, I won't go into the details of this. If people are interested, I can make a talk about it. But uh, you can do some, some nice math and make some graphs in order to go from things like our standard VMAG into the Gaia mag and go back and forth. So it's really, I wouldn't be surprised if say uh, a decade from now or so, we're not talking you know, Vega mag, we're all talking about Gaia mags or so. It, it's gonna have an impact in the astronomical community. And I just put down here in purple, uh, you know, it, it's making hundreds of other achievements and discoveries. Uh, you can only imagine if you're observing that many stars, what, and it's not only observing all the photons from the stars, but it's observing the movement of the stars as well. And there have been lots and lots of discoveries, uh, kind of silent because it's not, the mission wasn't dedicated to a single big topic uh, in the astronomy, um, it, it, in the community. Uh, it's, it's kind of just a catch-all out there and it's kind of a do what you will with the data. But astronomers have been able to make some really interesting discoveries. So if you want to learn more about it, uh, and I I would implore you to go do so. It's really, really interesting. The Gaia homepage is there, again, the ESA, because it's highly ESA ran. Uh, you can go onto the website and download the data uh, right there. It's, uh, it's a little hard to get around. Uh, but it, it's pretty nifty once you learn all the buttons and stuff. Uh, and then the big one is this news archive down here. If you wanted to go about, they do a great job of, of taking all the published articles and making them into sort of magazine-like uh, articles that you can just go and read that anybody can really easily understand. And then all of the published papers are there if you wanted to dive deeper or so. Uh, so that's all I have. And I, I hope you found it interesting and, and maybe you'll go out and learn a little more about it. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing there. Well, thanks. Um, many of you <laughs> know that intelligent life does exist elsewhere in the universe, but it's never been satisfactorily proven. Um, but tonight's guest might have a different opinion on the subject. And uh, as I told you, the Delaware uh, Astronomy uh, Book Club has been reading Avi Loeb's book, um, which does not conclude that there is intelligent life, but that we should consider that there is. Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over to human Jeremy Carlo, who will introduce tonight's guest. All right. Thanks so much, Harold. 
I'm really excited about uh, tonight's guest speaker, but uh, first a couple quick announcements. Just a reminder, if you are not the invited speaker, uh, please mute uh, during the presentation. We'll just keep the, uh, the noise level uh, down during the talk. And a little preview, uh, next month, we will have uh, Michelle Hanlon from the University of Mississippi, and she's gonna talk about space and law. So I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about what that topic will be, and uh, hopefully we'll have a more uh, detailed announcement uh, in time for uh, the May uh, newsletter, which should be coming out in the next uh, week or so. All right, so tonight uh, we are very uh, pleased to have uh, Dan Wertheimer with us. Uh, Dan is the Watson and Marilyn Alberts Chair in the Department of Astronomy at uh, the University of California at Berkeley, and is also a scientist working with SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He's been active uh, in that since uh, 1979. Uh, he's the co-founder and chief scientist for SETI at Home. You may remember uh, that. He's the principal investigator for Serendip, which has been a long-running uh, SETI program, as well as the Worldwide Collaboration for Astronomy Signal Processing and Electronics Research, which if you work out the acronym is CASPER. He's also uh, heavily involved in optical SETI and a program called Panoramic SETI or PanoSETI. So he's worked with a number of different telescopes, uh, including uh, Arecibo, which as we all know, uh, met its uh, ill-fated uh, end last year. Uh, he's taught at San Francisco State University. He's also taught classes around the world in France, China, Peru, uh, Egypt, a uh, number of countries uh, throughout Africa. Uh, he was the winner of the Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization in 2019. And that's a very shortened introduction. Uh, he does have a Wikipedia page, which you can uh, check out as well. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming to the DVAA, Dan Wertheimer. So Dan, take it away. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, can you guys see my uh, my screen there, the title page? Yeah. Yes, I can. Okay, great. Hey, thanks for that kind introduction and thanks for inviting me today. I got interested in astronomy through an organization very similar to yours, except I was in San Francisco and I took a class from John Dobson and he taught me how to build a 12 inch reflector and um, I got interested in, in SETI through a club, just, just like what you guys are doing. So I really appreciate the, especially the outreach and educational work that you do, uh, that you, you were talking about this evening. Um, so as Jeremy mentioned, I, I wanna talk to you about this question, are we alone? Is, is anybody out there? And uh, you guys know the field is called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And um, you probably have heard of this Drake equation, which there's Frank Drake there. And Frank worked out this equation really just to organize a conference. He thought it would wait to break a big problem, are we alone, into individual problems, which are these little questions on, on the right side of the equation. N is the number of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy that we can talk. There's, the problem with this equation is that we, it takes this big unknown and breaks it up into other unknowns, but we really don't know the answer to most of these unknowns. So you can't really and find out how many civilizations there are in the galaxy. You can't really do this with a kind of theory, mathematical approach. You've got to go out and look. Um, but I want to give you a hint how this equation works. Um, so you, it starts with the numbers. And then it says, well, how many planets? The P is for planets. How many planets are there on typically going around those stars? And then once you have a planet, the next thing is, for life. The E here is for environment. So you, it's a whittling down process. You go from stars to planets and then how many planets have the right environment. And the next thing is if you have a planet with the right environment, this L is for life. In planets with the right environment, does life get started on? Um, and the next thing is if you got life get started, do you get intelligence? That's I for how, how often do you get intelligence? And the next thing is about intelligent creatures, do they develop communication technologies? Do they have lasers or radio or some way that we could communicate with them? And the last factor, civilization. Uh, you know, the earth has been around about 5 billion years. Some stars are 10 billion years old. They're We're kind of middle-aged. On the other hand, you can imagine civilizations that blow themselves up as soon as they discover radio and lasers and ways to communicate. 
Dan, sorry to interrupt okay. that your audio is chopping out periodically. Oh, shoot. Um, okay, I'm going to turn off my video. Uh, let me see how to do that. Hang on a second. Lower left hand corner. Yeah, it's not coming up. I think I've got to stop sharing to get that menu back. Damn. Uh, I don't know why. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn off my video. Huh, that's weird. I might be able to shut it off. Uh, I can stop it on from my little. Yeah, I, I think I can stop. It off. Oh, I can't stop my video. I did. Oh. Okay, but can you still see my screen? Yeah. Oh, good. But can you hear me? Yeah, we oh. can hear you. All right. Hey, can you let me know if you're still if I'm still choppy, um, and then I can try switching to a different computer. Um, is okay. is most of what I said intelligible? Yeah, it's, it's like every maybe 20 seconds or so you, you cut out for about two or three seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, well, let me know if that happens again. I apologize. Um, in theory, I have a gigabit connection here, and I don't know why it's chopping out. Um, okay, so interrupt me if it chops out, and we'll try to figure out something else. But I'm hoping that now that I've turned off my video and you're just getting audio from me and these slides, it'll, it'll work a little better. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about these factors in the Drake equation, and then we'll talk about SETI searches, uh, how to look for ET. So one of the factors you might remember is how many planets there are. And we did not know the answer to that question until about 25 years ago. It took a long time for astronomers going find, to find out about planets going around other stars. As you know, planets are little dinky things compared to the stars, and they're right next to these really bright things, the stars. And you know, the, a million Earths could fit into the side of the sun. They don't give off light. So uh, the planets were found indirectly. You can't see them even with really good telescopes. Uh, but what you find, what you the star, the star wiggles a little bit from the gravity of the planet. And if the planet moves a little bit toward you, the colors shift a little bluer. The Doppler effect. If the from you, it just, it doesn't move much. It just moves at walking speed. The colors get a little redder. And this was uh, one of the first exoplanets formed. And you can see it wiggling back and forth. Planets here, the slow wiggle and the more rapid wiggle uh, that betrays the presence of the two planets. And then um, more recently, you might know that planets were found with the Kepler mission using a different method called the occultation method and um, the occultation method is um, when a planet star, the light dims a little bit, not much. It doesn't block much of the surface of the star. <clears throat> so Kepler was just a camera in space that just continually taking pictures uh, in a seven degree field of view. And, and it would occasionally see these dimming stars and, and if, and if it detected a periodic dimming, then that betrays the presence of planets. And Kepler found about 3,000 planets, many of the multiple planet systems. And if you extrapolate on the field that Kepler found, now we know there are about a trillion planets in the Milky Way, um, five times more planets than there are stars. So lots of planets. And a lot of them are in the Goldilocks zone, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, Dan. It, it seems like your audio cuts out when you move the mouse cursor. Oh, I'll stop moving the mouse cursor. All right. All right. Thank you for that tip. Uh, I don't need to point to the green planets. You can see them. The, those are the habitable zone planets. So there are lots of planets. There are lots of good places for life. Little rocky planets, liquid water. We think lots of places for life. The next factor you might remember is if you have a good planet, how often does it uh, start life? We really don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, the Drake equation is listed in the order of unknown. So now we're getting into really unknown territory. One thing that makes us optimistic is that life got started on Earth very quickly. As soon as the rocks cooled down, um, you know, uh, life popped up. And the early, oldest rocks you can find have fossils on them. 
So the fact that it got started here quickly, even though we don't understand exactly how it got started, because it got started here quickly, that means it's a fairly probably will get started quickly on other planets, but we really don't know. But people have done experiments where they simulate the early conditions on the earth. This was a, an experiment done in the sixties that you, you uh, take a flask and you put in the flask some methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen. We know those chemicals molecules were around when the earth was forming. You put some sparks in because we know there was lightning five billion years ago. Gorillas crawling out of this thing, but you do get the basic building blocks of, of, of life, the amino acids, the, the things that make up the complicated RNA and DNA molecules. And so, um, so uh, we're beginning to understand how life got, got started. And the next factor you might remember is intelligence. And we think that takes longer, at least it did on Earth. It took, you know, four billion years from when life got started to intelligent creatures. There's a lot of different intelligent creatures on Earth that took completely independent evolutionary paths. Um, so we think life gets started on other planets, but it, it did take a long time to get intelligence here. Um, one of the things that we've learned recently is we thought you had to be kind of in the Goldilocks zone, but now that we found liquid water on, on moons going around Saturn and, and Jupiter, um, you know, pretty comfortable. There may be something. The, the problem is it's covered with ice. That, that white stuff on the outer layer is about 30 miles thick of ice. But the blue stuff is liquid water at a warm temperature heated by the, the tidal friction as, as uh, Europa goes around Jupiter, the water sloshes around and that friction um, similar to the way that the tides move on Earth uh, as, as we go, as the moon goes around us. And uh, that would be hard to do. We'd have to get through the ice somehow. But there's another moon you might know about called Enceladus, which, is, you know, all these moons are pretty easy to see with amateur telescopes. I'm sure a lot of you have seen them. So the nice thing about Enceladus, it's got the same deal with the liquid water covered by ice, but it's got fissures and cracks in the ice. And the water can, uh, comes out in these plumes that you can see at the bottom of the slide. And NASA and East through the plume and then uh, see if there's some small creatures uh, in, in that gas squirting out uh, the liquid water that turns into gas as it squirts out through the cracks in the ice. Okay, I now want to switch to SETI. Um, and I'm not the first guy to think about SETI. Uh, Gauss, the mathematician, uh, 200 years ago said, uh, to get in touch with ET, let's make a large geometric structure on the Earth, a right triangle, maybe three, four, five miles on a side, big squares of dirt, water, wheat. And ET would look down and find out they'd have to have a big telescope to do that, but then they, they'd and then they'd get in touch with us. Um, it was a really cool idea, but unfortunately not funded. Uh, Von Littron also a couple hundred years ago suggested we dig a circular ditch uh, 20 miles across and fill it with kerosene and use the match that I've drawn there, not to scale, to make a bright circle of light, a bright ring of fire. ET would see this thing with their good high-res telescopes and, uh, and they might get in touch with us. Uh, it met with a similar fate. A really cool idea was um, Charles Crow who suggested that we get in touch with the Martians um, using large mirrors, one where he lived in Paris, and the ET would see these bright uh, lights on the earth where the mirrors were, uh, 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 the, the Martians would see these bright lights. And, and I think you can guess what happened with that. And pornography into space. So this, you might know, is this is a plaque on the Pioneer 10 spacecraft that left the earth in the 70s. And, on the bottom, there's a little picture of the solar system with the sun and Mercury, Venus, and you can see the spacecraft leaving the Earth. Uh, and then on the right, you see a couple of humans, very controversial. Um, some people thought they should be clothed. They were originally holding hands, but NASA then said that might confuse the aliens. They'll think it's one creature, so they're distinct humans. They're, if they want to find out how tall the humans are, they're standing um, in front of the spacecraft there, the Directions to pulsars near us 
with the times of the pulsars, the periods of the pulsars, so they'll know where we live and they can come eat us. That was the first sort of funded uh, communication with extraterrestrial project. So the kind of lessons that you might want to are maybe SETI is too anthropocentric. Like right now, we think we should look for lasers or radio, but given our history of 200 years history, um, maybe we should um, be, uh, maybe from now, maybe 200 years from now, people will be laughing at what I'm doing, like what we're laughing at what, you know, Charles Crow and, and Gauss were doing. So one of the ideas now is that Earthlings are sending off a lot of radio and television out into space. Uh, this is a plot of television power leaving the Earth as a function of time. And you can see we're getting brighter and brighter. We're growing exponentially. Of Lucy and Ed Sullivan have gone past 10,000 stars. The nearby stars have seen the Simpsons. So if we're doing that polluting space with our radio and radar and television, Maybe ET does that as well. Hey, how is my audio now that um, I'm not using the mouse? Is it working okay? It's still cutting out once in a while, but it seems to be going all right. Okay. Uh, all right. Thanks. I'll just keep going then. I won't, I'm not going to switch computers. So Earthlings have even sent messages intentionally. This is a, a deliberate message. Arecibo, the telescope in Puerto Rico, has got a transmitter on a two megawatt, very powerful transmitter. This was 25,000 light years away. Radio goes at the speed of light. So uh, I've got my alarm clock set for 50,000 light years uh, from now because it'll take 25,000 years to get there, 25,000 years to get back. Maybe we'll get a message back. And you can see it's got a, the, the, the yellow there is the, the solar system with the sun on the left and Mercury and Venus. And then Earth is tip toward the human. To the right of the human is the population of the planet. Uh, down at the bottom in purple is the Arecibo telescope and the diameter in, in blue, amino acids in green. Um, we think pictures might be a good way to, to communicate. Uh, um, so you can imagine signal types that we might get from another civilization. I think the most likely be some kind of artifact that you know, it wasn't really meant for us, just internal communication or maybe communication between their planets or their moon and their, their planet. Uh, another possibility might be maybe they've seen oxygen or atmosphere. If they're nearby, maybe they've seen our TV. Maybe they send a deliberate signal our way. Uh, and uh, that would be really amazing. We could learn a lot. I think if we, if we get a deliberate signal, it'll probably be anti-cryptographic. Uh, and they might send their whole Library of Congress, all their music, poetry, literature. They might tell us how to get on the galactic internet. We could, we could learn a lot. So I'm not the first guy to do this SETI experiment. The, the early radio pioneers, Tesla and Marconi, uh, did searches for ET. Actually, they thought they had found ET. It turned out they were listening to distant lightning bolts. They, they sound like whistlers. Um, when you get the lightning bouncing off the ionosphere, and they heard that those whistling noises and thought they had found ET. Um, at Berkeley, we have about a couple of dozen people uh, working on this, mostly students. They come from the engineering departments and we're supported by the National Science Foundation and NASA and the Breakthrough Foundation uh, and individual donors uh, around the world that keep the students going. And especially in the summer, we're very grateful to individuals and um, we, we actually um, got some money from, um, what's Darlene? So the, the Rotary Club helped us out and helped sponsor some of the students and the city at home students. Uh, and then we have companies that donate uh, some uh, of the equipment that we use. For me is that right in front of the astronomy department is a really good parking spot, but you have to get a Nobel prize to park in front of that building. Um, so that's. That's what, I, what I'm kind of hoping for. So we have different telescopes that we use around the world that work at different wavelengths. Some work at visible, uh, visible wavelengths. We also are looking for laser signals in the infrared. And then we have different radio telescopes to look for radar, radio, communication, 
um, you know, or maybe analogs of television that, that work at different wavelengths that get through the atmosphere. I'd say right now we're, we're not doing a very good job covering the whole electromagnetic spectrum. That, that takes too much work right now, but things are getting better, the telescopes, the equipment, the, the receivers. And so I think eventually uh, Earthlings will be able to do a thorough job. But right now, our first search was funded by NASA. And you probably know NASA requires that use acronyms. Serendip is a search for extraterrestrial radio missions from nearby developed intelligent populations. Um, and this was our first radio telescope. It's a big radio antenna in Northern California uh, at Hat Creek Observatory. It's 85 feet across. And while we were using this telescope, this is what happened to it. You can see the, the dish on the ground there. And so we, we moved, that was the end of that telescope. We moved to West Virginia. This is a, a 300 foot diameter telescope, even bigger than the, the one we started on. We used that in the 80s. Uh, and while we were using this telescope, this is what happened to that telescope. So that happened twice to us. Um, then we had another kind of problem at our optical telescopes that we were using at Lick Observatory. There was a big fire. You can see where it scorched came right up to the telescope that we we're using. So we moved to Arecibo Observatory, um, which uh, is a, was until recently the world's largest telescope. It's a thousand feet across. That bowl, that reflector there at the bottom, it doesn't look shiny to you, but to radio waves that's shiny, the aluminum panels, um, that reflects the light up to the focus there. At the, that holds about 10 billion bowls of cornflakes. We figured out a way to use this telescope at the same time that others are using it. So we'd go along for a ride. It's called uh, commensal SETI or piggyback SETI. So we could use it all year round, 24 hours a day. Um, and uh, while we were using that telescope, and um, this is the, the movie of the Arecibo collapse, um, feet above the dish. You can't see the dish in this movie, but um, that's cables that were supporting that platform, three inches in diameter snap, and the platform tapped uh, off. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, that happened just last year in, in December. Hey, Dan, you're getting a lot more cutting out just in the last minute or so. Oh, I see, because of the fast video yeah okay well i'll try not to show movies or i'll try not to talk during the movies right. could you guys see the video okay it, it was kind of choppy it was like a stop motion thing okay well maybe i'll just skip the films then i got a few more films anyway the reason that all that happened according to the world weekly news is that the aliens did not want to be discovered the telescopes were zapped by by hostile space aliens um, so one of the problems in SETI is that we don't know what broadcasting on. So we, we, um, we build these things called multi-channel receivers. So you can see here that we're looking at many channels at once, channel number 2,264,199. Uh, on the right is channel number 2,264,000. And the idea is that there's a strong signal at one of these channels. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. It's like tuning your radio across the dial and looking at the power meter uh, strong at one of these channels. And actually it's better than that because it's like having billions of, of radios, each one tuned to a different channel looking at the power meters because we can listen to a lot of channels at once. Um, another thing we want to do is look of signals that are changing in frequency. Or, and that can happen because Transmitters are, might be on planets, the planets are spinning around, they're going around their star, and that introduces this Doppler drift, the change in frequency as the, with the acceleration of the transmitter. So when we look for things like that, that, that you can do with your eye, you can see those patterns there, but um, it, we have about every second. So we need a lot of eyeballs. Uh, computers can do it too, can find these signals, but it takes a lot of computing power. Another thing we wanna to look, to, look for is pulsing signals that here I've circled uh, a bit, 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 those four things that I've circled, but 
It turns out if I take away the circles and just say, do you pattern? Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's hard to do with your eye. Um, you can do it, but it takes a long time. We have 100 million of these things to look at every second. The, um, so we, um, we've, been, um, we've been thinking about how to get a lot of computing power to do a kind of thorough search to look for these pulsing signals and drifting signals. And a lot of you might know about this project called SETI at Home, where in specialized processes, we ask volunteers around the world to help us if you have a computer or a cell phone. So what we did is we recorded the data at the Arecibo telescope. We have a couple petabytes of data from 20 years of observing there. You can observe the whole sky visible from Arecibo multiple times. Then we break the data up into what we call working. And what you do is you download this free screensaver program and you install it on your computer. And when you go out for a cup of coffee, it pops up like a screensaver. This is, I apologize, another video. Cup of coffee. It, it on the it reminds you kind of the right ascension declination, the coordinates, the part of the sky, what frequency band you're looking at. It reminds you what your name is. It shows you the interesting signals. And it, after a few hours, when you're done, um, maybe I'll skip that video. So when you're done analyzing the data after a few hours, it'll send the results back over the internet. And um, you will, um, if you're the lucky one that finds the ET that get the Nobel Prize, but you might have to share it with a lot of people. There are 8 million people that have participated in 226 countries. They built one of the biggest supercomputers on the planet. They average about a thousand years of computing every day compared to if we just had one volunteers do in the, in, the, uh, in, in one day. Um, and uh, so we're really grateful. It's the most sensitive search that's ever been done because of all that computing power. Look for a much richer variety of signal types than has ever been done. Um, and uh, so um, we're, that project is um, kind of in hibernation now because Arecibo another telescope in China, which is even bigger than, it's a brand new telescope. And it's even bigger than Arecibo. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about SETI spinoffs. We haven't found ET, but some other good things have happened along the way. Uh, one of the things that uh, you, you, you were talking about earlier and, and uh, Darlene from the Rotary Club was mentioning is the educational and outreach aspects of SETI. Are we alone? It's a good hook because it touches on you know, this question, are we alone? You can get kids interested in astronomy and physics and how does life get started? And that's about biology and evolution and sociology, how long do civilizations live? And they can learn uh, anthropology. And it is a good hook for kids. And we developed this curriculum with the Lawrence Hall of Science. It's gone around all over the world now and many countries it's used in mostly uh, elementary schools and middle schools. Um, and it's, op it's free curriculum. It's kind of um, code that lets you participate in lots of different volunteer computing projects. So you can use your computers at home, not just to do SETI, like SETI at home, but um, you can or distributed computing, or we call it the kind of democratization of scientific computing. And you can do, uh, you can pick from about 30 projects now. It's a big open source project. And um, you can say how you want your computer to be used. So you can say you want 30% of your spare computing cycles for SETI and 20% for cancer drug research. There's a, one of my favorites now is COVID therapeutic drug research. You can look for gravity waves. This is, uh, this is climate prediction, global warming. This is gravitational wave research. This is looking for black holes. This is the, um, the uh, looking for COVID-19 drugs, therapeutics. Citizen science projects where we're not just using your computers and, and cell phones to do the analysis, but using your eyes and ears. Um, we work with our colleagues to send out a spacecraft out to a comet and it's a sample return mission. We flew through the tail of a comet. 
and uh, they're in this aerogel foam. We also scooped up some inter interplanetary project uh, um, particles, the, inter the cosmic dust that was around five billion years ago when the planets were forming. And um, in order to find these little microscopic particles, we, we took millions and millions in the aerogel and you can take a little training course and you can download the Stardust uh, at home and you, you learn how to find these particles and uh, you can look through these photographs and run a virtual microscope at home on your laptop computer. And if you find a, a especially if you find a, one of these planetary particles that made this planets form, you get your name on a, on a nature paper. It's kind of a big deal. We've only found a few of those so far. And there's a bunch of these citizen science projects. Another thing that kind of a spinoff of SETI is that these powerful SETI instruments that we originally developed to look for ET were used all over the astronomy community. They made the, they found a lot of pulsars, they discovered fast radio bursts. Uh, they, they found a planet made out of solid diamond. They're used in medicine now. We, we work with some brain researchers to get uh, put electrodes in a brain and get the data out through a wireless link. Hope eventually will get used for to go control a prosthetic arm without having a bunch of wires coming out of your brain. We've had a lot of students come out of this thing that have done a lot of work. Um, I want to switch to um, future SETI experiments, um, kind of short term and long term. So I, I mentioned that we we're just starting to work with our. Hey, Dan, you're, you're cutting out a lot more now. Wonder if it, oh. Is it possible to switch to the other computer quickly? Um, yeah, Let me, uh, that'll take about two minutes. Okay, um, yeah, because so, you get better for a while, but it seems like it's picked up again. Yeah, I'm really sorry. I don't, um, I'm not sure if the, I'm gonna try it. And then it'll be interesting for me at least to know what's going on here. Um, to, is there something running in the background or another computer uh, taking a lot no. of data? My, that, boy, it's a pretty powerful laptop. And Dan, is there anyone, Dan, is there anyone else in the house utilizing the bandwidth for something? No, no. I'm okay. All alone. Okay. At 19. So let Jeremy, me just, don't we have a phone number for dial-in? Oh, yeah. I could do that. I could do the audio over the phone if that's useful. Would that that's useful as long as you turn off your audio this, from your computer, right? Is that better than, um, you think that's better than trying the other computer? The other computer has a dedicated fiber. No, I think that's a better idea. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll be lower downtime if you just phone in. Yeah, I don't know the phone number though. I'm gonna have to look that up. It'll take it me a couple be. minutes. Uh, okay, well you do that, Jeremy. I think I'm gonna try, um, connecting with my uh, computer that's got a gigabit ethernet. All right. And um, I'm gonna mute my microphone. Let's see. So. Hey, um, let's see, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I've switched computers. Okay, let's see if that works better. I'm gonna, maybe just to make, I'm gonna get out of this thing, out of the, my old computer, just so I don't clog up the bandwidth, like you were saying, you know, maybe I've got two computers using the network. And, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just share my screen. Oh, let me bring up, I got, I'm sorry, I got to bring up, uh, let me bring up an application here.
Uh, let's see, where were we? Oh. Um, right. I was talking about well, the future of SETI, right? Yes. Correct. Uh, okay, can you see that slide? It says future SETI experiments? Yes, yeah. I can. Okay. Uh, well, I hope the audio is better. I'm really sorry. I, um, this usually works quite well. I've been given a couple talks a week. Um, and I'll, I'm going to have to chase this down. So um, will you guys keep letting me know about the audio? Uh, and I, because I, I, I would, I need to resolve this problem because I got another talk coming up tomorrow. Um, All right, so, we'll go. okay, so let's see. Um, I want to talk a little about future, and I, I think I told you a little bit about this fast telescope. It's um, it's Arecibo is three hundred meters across. This is five hundred meters across, and we're doing a big sky survey with our Chinese colleagues. Uh, it's about three years to to survey the sky. Uh, this is in southern China, and what we what we're doing is um, simultaneously, while every, while we do a big raster scan of the sky, we're going to look for pulsars and map the galaxy and the hydrogen gas of the galaxy, do a fast radio burst search, and then we got a couple of SETI experiments, <clears throat> all working together to do a big uh, sky survey. Um, this is in the far future. This is an artist's conception, although we do have a prototype in in South Africa. This is, it turns out you want to build these telescopes far away from people and the interference that they create. There are a lot of, so, but this, in the desert of South Africa, in the Karoo, it's really hot and it's really dry and nobody lives there. There are no transmitters, no television. Your cell phone doesn't work. It's a good place for a radio telescope. And uh, there's a big international effort to build a, a huge telescope made out of thousands of these dishes, each one about 16 meters across. And uh, right now we have 64 dishes. Uh, it's called a prototype array called Meerkat, and we're starting to use that for, for SETI. Um, how, how's the audio now so far? Pretty, pretty good so far. Okay, good. Um, so another thing we're working on is this thing called Pano SETI. And what we're trying to do here uh, is uh, build a thing that can look at multiple places at once. Um, what we're worried about is that you know, most telescopes have a very small field of view. The, the big telescopes that we use, they can only look at a millionth of the sky at a time. So we might be looking at one place, but ET's flashing us, you know, in a different place. So if the flashes are rare, you know, once a week, once a month, or even once an hour, we'll be looking at the wrong place in the sky. It should be very hard to find them. So if you want to look for kind of intermediate things, the analogous of kind of, I don't know, supernova or fast radio bursts, you know, a thousand fast radio bursts goes, go off every day and they're the brightest things in the sky, but nobody found them until just a few years ago because you had to get lucky at pointing your telescope at the right place. But so we're trying to figure out how to build a telescope that can look at a big chunk of the sky. And so we're thinking about a hundred different telescopes poking out of the dome. Um, right now we only have two, but that's kind of what we hope to do. And there, each telescope is about 18 inches across and so right now what we have, we can look at a small, we know one star at a time, a millionth of the sky at the time at Lick Observatory. That's our one meter dish that we use for looking at, you know, one star at a time. But, um, and so you can see the stars we've looked at. Um, and the problem is, you, I don't know if you can see this animation. Can you see that red dot wiggling around there? That's yes. the problem is we're just looking at one little place in the sky. So it'd be easy to, easy to miss them if we can't. Um, if we're look, unless we can cover a big solid angle. So um, one of the things that's made this possible recently, it used to be that every pixel, every little place in the sky was a thousand dollars, but now there's this new detector that's only five bucks that was made for medical imaging. Um, and uh, so now we can kind of tile the sky with, with these new fast pixels that respond in a nanosecond. And the other thing that's cheap is plastic lenses, Fresnel lenses that aren't very good for getting good kind of angular resolution, really good imaging, but 
we don't really need that if we're just looking for laser pulses, flashes. We don't need a good uh, mirror or a good lens. So we can use these plastic lenses, Fresnel lenses. So we've got a little prototype here with 256 pixels and a graphite epoxy um, uh, telescope. And we assembled that together. This is the electronics at the focal plane. This is our little prototype telescope with the two telescopes at, at, at Lick Observatory that we have now. There's a little picture of these two 18 inch diameter telescopes and it's working pretty well. And we're hoping to scale this thing up. If, if any of you want to write us a big check, we'll build the whole thing with 100 <laughs> telescopes. Um, I'm kind of optimistic about this project because the, the history of astronomy is that you look at, if you look at someplace new that nobody's looked at before, we don't understand why, but usually find something. Like nature just seems to populate every part of the parameter space. Every, every time you look at some new size scale or some new wavelength or some new time scale, you know, so we're looking at nanosecond or millisecond, microsecond. Nobody's really looked there before. So maybe we'll find something new. Nature, we don't know why nature just seems to populate every, we know why uh, evolution populates life at all different ev uh, evolutionary niches. You know, if there's, if there's food and energy, creatures will evolve there. But we don't know why nature populates every size scale and every time scale and every wavelength scale. So maybe just by looking at something that nobody's looked at before, Maybe we'll find something new. We don't know. Um, so I'm optimistic in the long run. This is a plot of telescope power. It's doubling every, every four years or so. It's getting better and better. Computing power is, is as you know, growing exponentially Moore's law. Computers are as smart as lizards right now. But you know, in 30 years, they might be as smart as humans if Moore's law keeps going. And then we could do some really useful, interesting SETI experiments. Uh, be good for SETI, may not be good for humanity, depending on if we can use these computers wisely. Um, the, uh, this is the number of channels. Um, when I started, I built a thing with 100 channels in the 70s and 80s. And now we have, a, I think the, the biggest, the latest one is 38 billion channels. Um, and uh, so uh, I think I'll skip that one. This is, um, Oh, okay, let me stop the little animation. So this is a little movie of something that could happen in a hundred years from now. We don't know how to do this now, but the idea is how to get to, um, oh, hang on a second. How can we get to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri? And the idea is to build, and you, if you want to do it quickly, you deploy a spacecraft that's um, it's a very lightweight, just weighs one gram. It has no engine, no fuel. It's just a, a, a sail, just a very thin sail. And you shine light against it. Uh, you need a 100 gigawatt laser on the ground. And you shine light on that sail. And that accelerates it. In just a few minutes, it gets up to about 20% the speed of light. And by that time, it's outside of the solar system. The lasers don't, aren't very effective anymore. And just coasts for 20 years to get to Proxima Centauri. It's called Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, this is another thing we don't know how to do yet, but uh, this is how to make a really big telescope. So, you know, Einstein figured out that gravity bends light just like a lens bends light. And uh, the sun has a lot of gravity. So you can make a telescope the size of the sun. You can use the sun as a gravitational lens and it focuses light. We've seen that after Einstein told us how to do it. We've seen Mercury get bent by the sun and he predicted it. And, uh, so the problem with that is that you have to put a camera, the focus is way out behind, way out um, beyond Pluto. So we got to put a camera way out there. But if you could do that, you get 10 meter resolution on an extrasolar planet. That'd be very cool. Uh, that's a hundred years away, maybe. A couple of my favorite quotes about SETI, Phil Morrison said that SETI is the archeology span of the future. And I think what he meant by that was that if we ever find another civilization, technology from another civilization, it's gonna be very hard to find them if they just discovered radio and lasers the way we have. It's much more likely that um, they will be a billion or two billion years ahead of us. So we can learn about our future. How did they get through their bottleneck when they were all killing each other? Um, and, uh, and then Carl Sagan, this other quote said that SETI is profound either way. And I think what he meant by that was that um, if we get on the galactic internet, we find ET, we can learn a lot. Um, but the, it's also profound 
the other way, what if we, what if we do a big thorough search, which we can't do now, but maybe, you know, maybe um, in our lifetimes, we'll be able to do a very, very thorough search of many, many stars in the galaxy and a lot of different wavelengths, and we don't find anything. That means that intelligent life is incredibly precious, and we better take really good life uh, care of the life here on, uh, on Earth. So if you've been asleep, um, this is my summary slide. S no ET so far. We're still working on it. Uh, but it's not my last slide. I, I got a couple more. I wanted to, the SETI at home participants have been really terrific. They built one of the biggest supercomputers, made, made the most sensitive search on the planet. We're really grateful to the SETI at home volunteers, but they do other things. They've helped us write the code. It's a big open source project. They, they speed it up, they get the bugs out. They, they uh, I mentioned they send money that keeps the students going, and keeps the students fed um, that work on this project. They, uh, they, um, they've um, composed literature and music about SETI and they've also composed haikus. And I, I, I just want to read you a few of the haikus. I'll just read you a couple of the haikus that um, the SETI at home participants have sent us, but you can see more on the web. Um, so Paula Cook at Duke University, searching for life, answers are revealed about ourselves. And this is my last slide, a haiku by Dan Seidner. One million earthlings bounded by optimism leave their PCs on. Well, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I, I think we have, I hope we have plenty of time for questions and, and comments. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dan. We, we do have plenty of time for questions. And um, while everybody else gets ready to queue up, um, I'll take the prerogative of the chair and ask you, what are your thoughts about um, Avi Loeb's book, um, Extraterrestrial? <laughs> okay, so Avi, as you know, is a very provocative astronomer. Uh -huh. And this is not the first time that he's claimed something is ET. I think this is the third time that when an astronomical phenomena has discovered he, he says, oh yeah, that's, that, you know, that's probably another civilization. Um, I think the, so most of the book is, is about Oumuamua, which most astronomers think is not a spacecraft from ET. Um, let me back up a little bit. So um, for those of you who don't know, Oumuamua is, is, uh, uh, was found by a, a telescope on Hawaii called PanStars. And PanStars has this, it's beautiful. They look at this big wide field. And for a long time, astronomers have thought that when the planets form, you get a bunch of rocks and asteroids and all kinds of stuff flying around. And some of it leaves the solar system that, that's forming. Uh, were, and so we know that we've seen free floating planets. And, and so we thought that rocks would get flown out during, during planet formation out into space. And some of them would come to earth occasionally, or come, sorry, not come to earth, but come into our solar system. And they're hard to find though, uh, they're not very, they don't come into our solar system very often because they come from light years away. They got to get on just the right trajectory to come here. So people predicted that when PanStars was built, PanStars would detect about one a year of these, these uh, extra solar, extra planetary asteroids. And sure enough, about a year after PanStars was built, we found the first rock coming into our solar system. It was called Uamumua, which means visitor in Hawaiian. Um, uh, and now, since then, they found another one. And when Avi Loeb took a look at this, he said, oh, it's not a rock, it's a spacecraft. Um, but I, I, almost certainly he's wrong. Um, you know, I like provocative ideas. And as much as I'd like to think that there's life out there, I think the universe is teeming with life. This is almost certainly a rock. Um, and uh, the fact that astronomers predicted it, it does have some peculiar properties. Um, it wasn't, most rocks are kind of spherical, most asteroids are spherical, but this one is, um, it's, it's flat or it's kind of elongated. We know that because the, the brightness changes as it, as it spins around, you can see it fluctuate. And then the other thing that's peculiar about it, um, by the way, when people found out it was spinning around, Avi said, oh, it's not a, it's a broken spacecraft. It's, that's why it's kind of flipping around. And then when, um, when, uh, and then the other thing that's kind of peculiar that, that Avi got very excited about it is that it's not on an orbit that we would have expected just from gravity of our sun. It's on a high, it, it deviates a little bit from the hyperbolic orbit that you'd expect just due to gravity. 
And we've seen that before. Comets do that when they get near the sun. They outgas the, you know, they're, they have water and the water heats up and it, you get this kind of like a rocket phenomenon. The, the steam squirts out and, um, and that can kind of make a comet uh, deviate from its orbit slightly from the, from the orbit you'd expect. But Avi thought, oh, it's a rocket. You know, that's why it's deviating. So, I, you know, Avi's, I, I'm almost certain it's a rock. Everybody thinks obvious, you know, but I like provocative ideas, but the chances that it's a rocket ship from ET is, I would say, I wouldn't bet, a, you know, I wouldn't bet even a million to one. It could be, but um, I, I very much doubt it. But it, it's, I like provocative books. I like provocative ideas, but I think obvious uh, kind of a little too insistent that this is the only explanation. If you like provocative ideas, there's a question in the chat. Uh, Daniel asks, uh, recently there have been reports of UFOs on the internet. Do you agree with them or do you think they're just myths? Well, UFOs, there's lots of UFOs. UFO, as you know, means unidentified flying object. So whenever you see something in space that you're not, you don't know what it is, it's a UFO and there are lots of those. And um, I don't think any of them have anything to do with extraterrestrial civilizations. I, you know, I, I think the universe is teeming with life, but there's no very useful evidence that any of this has anything to do with ET that, uh, you know, people see this stuff. A lot of it's real phenomena. They, they see the space station going overhead. A lot of you have probably seen that. It's a very bright thing that goes over very quickly. Mm -hmm. Satellites do that. We get a lot of calls uh, when that happens. We get calls from Aurora. Uh, we get calls from, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, uh, but people think it might be a spacecraft. There are also imaginary things, you know, when, when Jules Verne, there were no UFO, there were no flying saucers until, uh, well, there were, there were angels, but after Jules Verne wrote about flying saucers, a lot of people started seeing flying saucers and, you know, a lot of people see what's in the movie. So there's, there's, you know, sometimes people are confused about what they dream and what they saw in the movies. And so I think some of it's imagined or confused between dreams and, and some of it's real though. Some of it are deliberate hoaxes, you know, crop circles and Eric Von Donegan and people making movies. They know that, you know, we found the, the models of the spacecraft they used and stuff like that. That's a combination of phenomena, but I think a lot of it's real stuff. Dan, question. What's the, what's more likely microbial life uh, or uh, human, yeah. human type uh, intelligent life? Well, there? I, so, we don't know, but we, I think most people, including myself, think that microbial life is much more common. Might even be in our own backyard. You know, we might find it on Europa or Titan or Enceladus. And uh, that'd be really interesting. I, there's, there's, there's not gonna be really intelligent life in our own solar system, but there could be microbial. My guess is that the universe is just teeming with microbial stuff uh, because the, on earth, you know, it just popped up right away. Intelligence, right. I think, is much rarer. Right. I have a, a comment um, going back to Oumuamua. The, 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 the latest explanation I heard, which uh, seems to fit very well, is, is that it's probably a chunk of um, uh, nitrogen ice, similar to what you yeah. saw in Pluto. Uh, and that, that explains it very, very well. I think and you're right. Like, I, I mean, I, I read that recent paper. Maybe you saw that paper of that uh, these guys worked out you know how it can how it can deviate from the expected gravitational orbit with with the nitrogen outgassing, and they they worked out you know why it could be um, changing in brightness, and they they it beautifully explain all the kind of phenomena that Avi uses to say it's a rocket ship by just more natural chunk of chunk of nitrogen ice. I have an, another question about Starshot. So let's say we get this one gram satellite to Proxima and Centauri in 20 years, what's going to do there? It's, it's <laughs> not going to have the power to, to send us back anything. Right, right. So um, they have built this little camera, camera that they already have actually kind of working. It's a little chip that they hope will be attached to the spacecraft. And they then you kind of, well, how do you get the data back? So they mm -hmm. they want to somehow use that sail as a, as a kind of parabolic, uh, you know, mirror. And they shine a little laser against it. Uh, you know, to reflect the light back, you know, a four meter telescope, basically. 
to reflect the laser light back and somehow get the image. So this is not technology that you and I know how to do. You know, there's, a, there's all kinds of problems. No, I don't think there's anything sort of uh, that breaks the laws of physics. I mean, it can be done, it's an engineering problem, but you got to make the sail only a few atoms thick, you know, so it can still be less than a gram. And if it absorbs any light, you know, it burns up right away. It's got to be super, super uh, reflective, you know, 0.99999. So it doesn't get burn up from the laser that you're shining against it. There are a lot of engineering problems. Um, but uh, so I don't know when it, it can happen. Like you mentioned, how are we going to get the data back? And it's flying through really fast. Like, how do you take a picture when you're flying through a 20% of the speed? Line? There's, you know, seven different things that we don't really know how to do, but I, I don't think there's anything like, there's no fundamental physics that says it can't be done. If a question came in from uh, YouTube from uh, Jeff, said, uh, thanks, Dan, wonderful talk. Said, it seems for a long time, SETI has been said to receive too little funding. Uh, is that improving and is it largely government funding or private donors? Well, um, until recently, our group at Berkeley was largely supported by NASA. I would say, well, maybe a third was private, but we just got this huge grant from the Breakthrough Foundation. It's called this project called Breakthrough Listen. And um, they would like us to spend a hundred million dollars over 10 years. And we've been at it now for three years, a huge amount of telescope time that we're able to use on the world's largest telescope. They bought us time on um, the, the new Green Bank Telescope, a telescope in Australia, um, because we, you know, in the North, we can only look at the Northern stars. And we, uh, that telescope I mentioned in South Africa, that's a breakthrough listen project uh, using the Meerkat telescope. And they've also given us money to do an optical search uh, you, at Lick Observatory looking for laser lines. And that, that's huge, $100 million is way beyond what we've ever spent on SETI or anybody has ever spent on SETI. And so that's private. Thanks. Actually, two kind of related questions came up in the chat. Uh, one is uh, considering the distance between stars, do you think we'd ever be able to communicate with extraterrestrial life effectively then the related question is, do you think wormholes could be used uh, in communication? Well, I don't know about wormholes, but let me answer the first question. I, I think, um, yes, I think communication at the speed of light is not the kind of communication between individuals. It's not like, you know, hi, how's your mom? How's your wife doing? You know, because it might, I don't think the nearest civilization is going to be on Proxima Centauri. That's That'd be four years to get the message there and four years to get back. But, you know, maybe it's 100 light years away or maybe it's 50 light years away. So that's, we're talking about communication between civilizations. So you send a message and then they send back a message, a hun, you know, and you get it 100 or 200 years later. But I think that's still interesting, even though you can't maybe do a lot of round trips in an individual's lifetime. You know, there are really good examples of that. We, um, we can't talk back to Shakespeare or the, Homer, who wrote, you know, the Greek classics. Uh, and, but it's still very interesting to hear what they had to say. And so I, um, even though you don't, you, it's not sort of quick response, you know, they, we might send our, everything we know about our civilization, they might send everything they know about their civilization. Um, so wormholes, um, if there is a wormhole near us, it would still take a long time to get to us. The nearest wormhole, I think, might be, well, we don't even know if they exist, but I, it's hard for me to imagine that there would be one near us. But so imagine there's one 100 or 1,000 light years away. It still doesn't really help. You can, unless we go there or something like that. Yeah, because you got you to get, you get your message to the, you know, at the speed of light to the wormhole. And then you could go really fast, you know, to another galaxy or another, place with a wormhole. But so unless we're right near a wormhole, which might be kind of bad for us. Um, so I, yeah, it seems unlikely. But I do think that the question is actually an interesting one. Like, is there some kind of technology that's much better than the speed of light? So right now, the fastest we can go, uh, according to the physics that we understand. But there's a lot of physics that we don't know about. You know, we don't know 97% of the universe is made of stuff. We have no idea dark energy. We have no idea what dark matter is. 
we don't really understand how the universe got started. So we know there's a lot of missing physics. And so that means that there could be something much better than photons which travel at the speed of light. Maybe they're tachyons, or if you watch Star Trek, you know about subspace communication. So the nature of the question, I don't know about wormholes, but I, I think that there could be something much better than, than the just mere electromagnetic communication. Well, uh, how about um, quantum entanglement? I mean, you yeah, know, we don't know. As far as we understand, quantum entanglement can't transmit any information. Um, but it's interesting because uh, quantum entanglement happens faster than the speed of light, but there's no way to get like a single bit of data with quantum entanglement. So, but I, I um, well, no way that we've figured out yet. <laughs> yeah, it has to require some new physics. So the um, so there's nothing now that we know about that goes with this, but maybe in a hundred or two hundred or a thousand years there'll be something much better. But I think you got to do what you know how to do. You know, if you told Christopher Columbus. Oh, you know, just don't sail to India to get the spices. Just wait 500 years. They'll have airplanes. It'll make your job a lot easier. But, you know, Columbus found something interesting. So um, I don't think we should wait around. Mm -hmm. Dan, I also thought you, um, oh, sorry. Uh, Dan, I thought your slides were very, very good. As far as your audio breakup, uh, once you switch, it was hell of a lot better. I did notice a pattern of like seven or eight cutouts and then your voice would be fine again. And then it would repeat again. I got a Google F at it because I thought maybe ET trying to contact us. But, uh, uh, but hopefully that helps you figure it out what, what the issue was. Okay, so it's better on this computer, but not completely. Absolutely. Well. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thanks for that. I, I'm, I'm not sure how to proceed now, but I'll, at least that, that helps me. Maybe it's the government trying to shut it down. Right. <laughs> All right. We have another question from, uh, from YouTube. Are there any plans to rebuild Arecibo? Well, there are plans, but there's no money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, so we just ended a, a, a kind of study of what, how you could replace it with about a thousand dishes. We think it's probably better to replace Arecibo with, with lots of little dishes all working together. There's advantage. It's maybe cheaper than a big dish now. It used to be that Every dish required a very expensive receiver, but the cost of electronics has come way down. And um, so it's, it's, it's not just cheaper, but you know, the smaller you make the telescope, the bigger the field of view. And so we can cover a lot more sky. And so there, anyway, there's scientific and uh, cost reasons. So we worked out a kind of preliminary plan, made it available to the National Science Foundation. Actually, they were the ones that requested it. Um, I was one of maybe a hundred people working on this. I just helped them with the, electronics and the digital stuff. Um, and that's a very preliminary plan, but it's a way for NSF to kind of, and we're having more meetings about it together with the National Science Foundation. So there's, a, there's some meetings coming up about different ways you could rebuild it. It's not clear there's money to do it, but it's good to start thinking about it. Thanks. Yeah, 1.4 gigahertz, that used to be, you know, the, uh, the Vanguard. You know, now you could buy $20 receivers at, uh, at that frequency. Yeah, that's why why we think it's a good way to build a telescope out of lots and lots of little telescopes because you can, you know, you can stamp them out like like hot tubs and and take advantage of that um, scale. Yeah, but two more questions in the chat. Uh, here's a good one: Do you think extraterrestrial life would want to communicate with us? <laughs> also, how would we communicate without a common language? Yeah. So. The motivation question is a really interesting one. So that's why I think if we ever find ET, it won't be somebody deliberately trying to beam some signal in our direction. Um, I, I think more likely is we just learn about their technology, some artifact, you know, we see their engineering or we see their radar or their navigational beacon that wasn't really meant for us. Um, so, you know, we're a very primitive emerging civilization. We're still killing each other. So it's hard for me to imagine that some advanced civilization, we probably in their catalog, you know, but much the way that we don't try to communicate with ants, you know, we're, we're biologists are interested. We put ants in our catalog, we study them, but we don't try to communicate with them. So it could be something like, um, you know, or maybe they're waiting for us to stop killing each other and, you know, um, stop developing weapons and, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe they, maybe they, maybe they're interested in communication. But um, 
I'm not sure what we have to offer to an advanced civilization. I do want to mention that we recently had an influx of ants in our house, and you can bet that I was trying to communicate with them. <laughs> well, I can only hope that they view us as civilized as ants. <laughs> There's way worse that we could be. It's right, so another question in the chat. Uh, does the Starship Daedalus project still exist? Um, I don't know much about that. I, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Okay. So another question here. Uh, do you think it's possible to have life without water? Oh, that is a very interesting question. So, you know, of course, life as we know it needs, you know, is carbon based and it's water based. And a lot of people think carbon is a, is probably all life that is, is going to be carbon based because carbon is like tinker toys. You can just make all these complicated things. And we don't know of any atoms or molecules that work as well as carbon. But this question, and, and we think water, water we know is a really good solvent. Ammonia is kind of an interesting solvent. There's a, but it could be very different kind of chemistry. Um, on Titan, there are lakes, but they're not made of water. They're made of, of methane. Uh, and uh, people are thinking about, could you make life out of, out of methane, liquid methane, uh, uh, it, which is colder, but it's, it's interesting. And one of the things that I'm interested in is if we, if we go to Europa or Enceladus and we find life there, is it identical to us? Like, does it made out of exactly the same 20 amino acids and the same DNA? So I think that's not really, probably, that's not independent biogenesis. It probably just started on earth and you know, rocks fly all over the solar system. Sometimes a big rock hits the earth and all stuff goes flying around. And you can imagine life transporting from, from earth over to Europa. So that would not be independent getting started if we find identical life on Europa or Enceladus, but, or maybe it traveled here. Maybe we are from, from Europa, you know, maybe it didn't start on earth, but, but if we find life that has a, a slightly different chemistry, you know, that the 20 amino acids that you and I are made of there's 200 amino acids and those 20 are probably just what was around in the tide pool, you know? And so my guess is that life will be some different chemistry. And if we find that you know, on Europa or Enceladus, then that means that there was an independent biogenesis of life. It happened two or three times in our own solar system, in our own backyard. That means the universe is teeming with life. What about comets? There was another question in the chat. Um, yeah, I, uh, so comets are much smaller than moons and planets. So I think, you know, it's more common. We think that life is more common if you have a big, uh, a lot of places where life, you know, we don't think it happens on, if you just take a little tiny bit of, uh, you know, it's more likely to happen on a big thing with a lot of places for life. It, um, we think life probably got started down at the bottom of the ocean where these thermal vents are. Um, so uh, you need a lot of free energy. Um, comets may not be a good place. P people are mostly thinking planets or moons where there's you know, a hot, heated water, thermal vents or something like that. But we really don't understand the process. So maybe, you know, maybe we're not thinking right. Yeah. Now here's a great question. This is actually the one that I wanted to ask. Uh, how do you answer the Fermi paradox? <laughs> Okay, well, let me explain it first. Obviously, the questionnaire knows, but maybe some of you. So Enrico Fermi was a physicist. He was sitting around at lunch and he said, where are they? If you know, if all this stuff that I've been talking to you about, you know, that life is common, you know, it starts real fast and we get lots of intelligence, then the, the universe should be, you know, and some civilizations are billions of years ahead of us. They should be zooming around the galaxy and they should be popping down on the White House and the United Nations and we should, you know, so if there are all these advanced civilizations out there, why aren't they here? Where are they? That was Enrico Fermi's. So it's kind of a paradox if you think that there's the universe is teeming with life and we're just kind of a middle-aged civilization. Space travel is probably not hard if you're, uh, you know, a little bit ahead of the earth and you can build self-replicating spacecraft and populate the galaxy. So, so then the question is, you know, well, if they're, if they're not here, they're not visiting us, does that mean there's no intelligent life in the universe or in the galaxy or nearby? That's what Fermi, that's the Fermi paradox. And I think 
there's a whole book about this called 50 Solutions to the Fermi Paradox, but I'll just mention a few. So one is one that we already touched on. Maybe it's like the motivation question. You know, are we just in their catalog, but we're just ants to them and that we, they've seen oxygen in our atmosphere. They know those, there's photosynthesis. They've maybe seen our early television shows, but we're just, we're just boring to them. Uh, another possibility is if you watch Star Trek, you know about the prime directive, you know, that you don't meddle around with emerging civilizations like, uh, because you want to let them evolve uh, and not sort of meddle with their, their outcome. Um, we don't know if that, but there may be kind of, so anyway, there, there are lots of kind of solutions to the Fermi paradox, but it's a really interesting question. Why, why aren't they, you know, building separate, replicating spacecraft and populating the galaxy? Hmm. Sure. Maybe I'll follow up a little bit on that. So, you know, if it is true that intelligent life is very rare, you know, given that the first number in the Drake equation is big, it's like 10 to the 11 or something like that, there has to be a bottleneck somewhere along the way. Oh, right. The big question that, you know, I've certainly been thinking about the last, you know, especially year or so, is that bottleneck could be something in our past that we've already gotten through, like right, right. evolution of intelligent life is rare, or is it something in our future that intelligent civilizations kill themselves off? So which one do you think is more likely? Right. Are we past well, it or is it in our future? Yeah, so, um, no, I, I, there, we don't know that all civilizations have bottlenecks. Um, and we, so there, but there could be, certainly we're going through a bottleneck right now. You know, we've got atomic weapons. We're about to have biological weapons. It's, it's cheaper and cheaper for, you know, right now you need a whole country to make a really nasty thing that kills a billion people. I think a hundred years ago, it'd be hard to kill a billion people. You know, maybe you could kill a hundred people with a machine gun or something like that. But that means in a, in a thousand years, or 100 years, you know, an individual will just talk to their computer and, you know, I want you to make a, an airborne part, you know, virus that wipes out humans or something like that. And it won't take a whole country to figure out how to kill a billion people. So we're, we're about to enter a bottleneck. And I think, and it, it's, it, it's uh, whether we can get through that and learn to use our technology and our science um, well, um, I don't really know. But I think if we wipe ourselves out, if we wipe out humans, it won't take very long for something intelligent to replace us. You know, it only took like a, a million years to get from chimps to humans. So I, you'd have to, you know, it, uh, that could be just a very temporary bottleneck. You know, a million years is, is just a blink of an eye in the geological history. So you might wipe out humans, but you'd have to wipe out like, but that would just, you'd just get intelligence back. And eventually, you know, you, you'd have selection effects that you'd get through that bottleneck. Might take a few, two, few wipings out. But, um, but um, if, you could, if you could somehow wipe out all carbon-based life, um, then you'd set us really back, you know, five billion years. Can you, com can you comment on the uh, architecture of the universe itself versus you know the issue that we're talking about right now. Uh, you were saying that the average distance between stars is about five light years, for instance. If it was any smaller, we would communicate easily. But if it was any smaller, we wouldn't be here, of course, because stars have to be with you know within a certain distance of the of the of each other for us to you know for life to develop in the planets around the, in the stars. So yeah. is this the intrinsic problem that we're running across that we are in a universe that is uh, populated by stars so far apart from each other, but the void in between them is so hostile to life. In other uh, words, you have to be within a constrained place well, for life to be. Right. So um, there's this problem that people have been thinking about, like, could you have life on a binary star, which is kind of similar to what you were saying, like if you had a another star, you know that half of the stars in the, in the galaxy are, are paired up with another star. We're, we're kind of a little bit unusual that we just have one star in our, in our solar system. But so there, there are different classes of binaries and you can imagine binaries where you don't want to live, where the, the other stars uh, are, you know, sometimes very close to you and sometimes far, it, you can have these orbits where you have two stars and the planets are doing figure eights around the two stars. And sometimes you're, it's cold and sometimes it's hot. That would be a very unpleasant place to be. Um, but uh, 
uh, some binaries are very, they're, they're right next to each other. The two stars are right next to each other. And that works pretty well because the, the, the planets just go around almost in an elliptical orbit. You know, it's like just having one star. And then there are a lot of binaries where you have a very wide, a very wide separation. So the planet going around here, but the other star is pretty far away. You know, if, it's, if the other star is way out beyond Pluto, it doesn't really make any difference. It's not, not heating up our, our planet. So it, I think most binaries are actually okay for life. You know, if the stars are pretty far away, then, then they work. If the stars are right next to each other, it works. But th there's this intermediate problem where the stars are kind of close to each other, like ones, you know, out at, I don't know, 10 astronomical units, where the planets are in very weird orbits and you don't, that's a bad situation. But luckily, um, so I think um, the stars being four light years away on average, they could be a lot closer. You know, we could have stars 10 times closer or 10 times further away. It wouldn't really change the chances for life. But if they get really close, that's a bad, that's a problem. Great, thanks. Another question from uh, YouTube. Uh, because of the inverse square law, what is the maximum distance at which uh, we could pick up signals from another yeah. civilization or from which they could pick up our transmissions? So the, um, as the questioner knows, the inverse square law is that the signals get weaker and weaker as they travel out, you know, because they've got to cover a more bigger sphere. And that's why it goes as the square. And so, um, so the signals travel out and they never die though. They just keep going out of the speed of light and they just keep getting weaker and weaker. And what that means is that for ET to see our television signals, they will need a bigger and bigger telescope to detect that stuff. It doesn't mean they can't do it. It kind of depends on the level of their technology and it depends on the level of the transmitting. So if we use like a big telescope to transmit like Arecibo, so two Arecibos, that's a dish a thousand feet across, they can communicate across the galaxy, a hundred thousand light years. You can send messages back and forth. Um, you know, they're very, they have, they're big telescopes a thousand feet across. Uh, you know, you, you can't communicate to another galaxy with a pair of Arecibos, but imagine something bigger in a hundred years from now or something, then you could do that. So it just means you need a bigger and bigger telescope the farther, farther away you are. So the answer as always is get a bigger telescope. Yeah, I think, I think you guys in your uh, Delaware Valley Club know that. All right. So Lou asked a question here. He said, if other life existed in the universe, uh, would you expect there some to be some common predictable connections? Um, yes. Uh, so um, I, it, it's, I don't think they're going to look anything like us. You know, you just think about the variety of life on Earth and octopi are intelligent and dolphins are intelligent. They don't look like us. And they evolved on the same planet as we did. So, so it, imagine life on another planet, you know, with different gravity and different atmosphere. They're going to be completely different looking. But I do think that the thought processes are likely to be similar. They're going to have to deal with their environment, whatever it is, they're going to have to uh, figure out, they're going to have to use imaging systems or radar, sonar, or something to visualize their environment in three dimensions. So I think pictures are going to be able to be kind of interchanged or maybe in 2D or 3D will be a common way that we could communicate with them. Even though I think the biology might be different, certainly they're, they're not going to look like this. But I think, we'll, I think if they're interested in communication, I think there'll be ways to to um, you know, send anti-cryptic messages back and forth, probably with pictures and movies and uh, mathematics they will share. I think there was an earlier question about communicating without a common language. Yeah. That, that gets a lot into Right, and I forgot to answer that, but I think pictures, math, you know, starting with you know, one, two, three, four, and, and maybe moving on to prime numbers or one plus one equals two, and, but pictures are probably good. They'll, they probably won't see in the same wavelengths that we see, you know, our eyeballs work uh, at, you know, with red, orange, green, blue, because the sun puts out a lot of those colors. Uh, but uh, imagine on a, on a M star that doesn't, that glows in the infrared mostly, they'll see in the infrared or they'll, you know, so, but, so, but maybe they can feel the image or look at it in the infrared, but the images I think will be. Uh, 
if you I have an intrusion of intelligence up. there. <laughs> All right, are there other questions? Yeah, I have another question actually. So, uh, you know, that what you've been telling us today, uh, nothing could be more important really in terms of knowledge than uh, knowing whether there is life in the universe, right? What's your sense about uh, politicians and governments uh, when they look at this and how much priority they give to this issue? Um, so I, I've testified to Congress before about SETI, um, and, uh, but I testified to the House Science and Technology Committee, and they, have, they were very interested in what we're doing, and they asked a lot of good questions, and one of the guys there is an, an amateur astronomer. And um, so I, I think that some of the government is interested. Um, and now we have a, a, a president who's very keen on science. And, um, but um, I'm not sure that, I don't think that was quite the question is like, I think the government funding, you know, kind of goes up and down. Uh, some, I think that NASA and NSF, some people are a little bit afraid to fund SETI. We've got some small grants, but I think they don't want to get people. A lot of people think that SETI is sort of like a search for flying saucers or, you know, and so I think there's a tendency in science in general to fund um, things that you'll have good results in, in a year or two. Um, things that are sort of, um, um, you don't really know that uh, whether you're gonna find ET or whether you're gonna find gravitational waves, you know, that took 50 years. Um, that's, a harder, that's a harder thing for governments to fund. And I think we need more of that to fund kind of um, pie in the sky research that may or may not lead to any discoveries. Uh, I think most of the funding goes into sort of guaranteed results, not risky uh, pie in the sky stuff like SETI. So there are any other questions? You can just speak up, uh, the chat seems to be uh, emptied out. Uh, Dan, I'm gonna ask you um, one more question about Professor Lowe, but it's a different question. One of the arguments he makes that I think is quite cogent is that treating Oumuamua or other such objects as presumably uh, uh, from intelligent life means that science needs to sort of reorient itself and promote things like SETI, promote interstellar archaeology, um, as opposed to treating it like another another comet or another asteroid, which really doesn't necessarily advance science at all. Can you comment on that approach? Well, I, I appreciate one aspect of, of uh, what Avi Loeb is, is suggesting, and I do think this gets back to what we were just talking about, this idea of doing speculative research and, and um, coming up with kind of wild and crazy, not mainstream ideas. I think that's very useful. And I think uh, uh, it's, you know, when Galileo first said that the, you know, sun was the center of the, of the solar system and uh, when he said there's stuff going around uh, Saturn and Jupiter, you know, that took a long time for people to accept. And I think there is something to that argument that we should be more willing to consider speculative and not mainstream arguments. Um, but I think um, with, so I think, Avi, I think we should be looking at all the different ex possible explanations for Oumuma. And I think Avi is right that, you know, we should be considering, could it be an alien spacecraft? I, you know, I don't think there's much evidence that it is. It's very unlikely that it is, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be considering it. Fair enough, thank you. Um, well, I really appreciate it. You guys asked a lot of great questions, um, interesting stuff. I, I can tell you're a, a thoughtful group and I, I thanks for, for listening and thanks for great questions. And thanks for all the great work that you do, especially outreach and teaching kids about science and astronomy. I, 
All right. Thank, thank thank you for joining us, Dan. I really appreciate it. It was a it was a notwithstanding the technical difficulties, it was an interesting uh, approach, and I love what SETI's doing. And I wish we could get more funding. You you really those slides really made the point that that we've been pursuing this for a long, long time and not getting funding for a long, long time. Okay. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, Dan. Um, anybody else have anything else for the uh, membership? There is one thing I wanted to say during my report, and um, I know Tom is doing this month's newsletter, but I, I have to say last month's newsletter was absolutely fabulous. It, it was, I mean, the content was incredible. I actually went online and started looking for, are there grants or awards to astronomy clubs for their, their um, newsletters? And I'm going to keep looking because darn it, we have the best newsletter of any astronomy club that i could e ever conceive it, of it turns out there is uh -huh. and indeed we won it well we gotta want it we should win it again <laughs> so that was yeah, great Carl won an award from the astronomical league yeah it's been about eight years ago something like that mm-hmm well, I'll look into that again because the the newsletter is just fabulous. It's it's really a great read, cover to cover, and I enjoy it immensely. So, thank you to all of you who are working on it. Yeah, and have been working on it. I right, said, so there's one more question in the chat. This is an interesting one. Uh, if we ever find extraterrestrial life, do you think we will treat them fairly, and do you think they will treat us fairly? You know, our track record is not very good. So, yeah. Um, so I would like to think that advanced civilizations are all have learned to live together in peace and are, you know, they want to help us out, but we, I don't really know that. And it, it's probably a naive thing. You know, I grew up in the sixties and, but so um, what I think earthlings should be doing is just learning more about the universe. Um, we are, we want to listen. We want to see if they're out there. There are some people that I, who I disagree with that think we should deliberately send messages to ET, kind of inviting communication, letting them know, you know, where we are. But I think there are some risks associated with that, probably minor, you know, but, you know, maybe they're going to say, oh, there's, uh, you know, there's palladium on their planet and we're just going <laughs> to grind it up and, you know, get all the planet, the palladium out of the, out of the earth and, you know, mine their whole asteroid belt. And so I don't know um, if they think of us like ants, like we, we you know, then they won't care about grinding up our solar system. So I, my thinking is that we should not deliberately send messages out into space. We should be, we're just an emerging civilization. We're a young civilization. We don't know what's out there. And um, we should learn more about the universe uh, before we try to engage um, other civilizations. See, you know, see if there are other civilizations out there and try to learn a little bit about what they're doing. That's called, uh, SETI or passive SETI, um, you know, just listening at first. Um, so I, I don't like this thing about that people call METI, message, sending messages or, or active SETI. Um, but luckily, there are very few people that advocate that. I think it just only been done a few times on Earth sending deliberate messages. Let me to push a little bit further. Do you think we should be taking efforts to conceal our transmissions then? Right, like the, the spheres of I love yeah. and all that going out. Should we right. be able to stop that? Well, yeah. So the people that want to do this deliberate transmission actually point that out. There's a, they want to point a, a powerful transmitter at a certain star or something like that. And they say, well, we're already doing that. We're already sending out television and radio. Um, but I think, you know, it's, the, it's a little different if you want to deliberately send something in a very powerful way than the leakage that leaves Earth. I think it would be very hard to turn off all of our communication. So it's pretty easy to not send deliberate messages, you know, to say to people, hey, that's not, that's a little risky thing. We don't know that they're going to, but you're putting 7 billion people at risk here. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the risks I think are not, not worth it, but turning off all radio and television and cell phones uh, and, maybe taking all the oxygen out of our atmosphere so they don't know there's life here. That, that I think is uh, not worth it. I well, just turn off the messages, I have the intentional a, messages. I have a question. Um, let's say you're on 
Alpha Centauri and you're looking at, at our sun, would you even hear the Earth's radio noise over the, the sun's radio noise? Oh yeah, so at television frequencies and radio frequencies, they are they far outweigh the power of the sun. So the sun is really wow. bright, as you know, at visible light. Yeah. But okay. uh, it's it's actually doesn't give off much radio. Hmm. And so um, we're way brighter than the sun, hmm. like by a factor of a million or something like that. Huh. Wow. But um, but you wouldn't want to uh, try to outshine the sun at visible light. That'd be a hard feat. You can do it. You can do it for a nanosecond. You can make a, a thing that is brighter than the sun for a short time. People know how to do that. We've tried that. Okay. Well, thank you again. All lots but, of. Yeah, I have another thank question. You did. Dan. Okay. Can I ask you another question? Sure. I'm just curious because uh, if life doesn't already exist, but it's just abstract for us to detect it or sense it. Okay. I mean, what kind of, uh, you know, you, where do you even start? <laughs> um, not sure. You know, maybe an order much bigger than one planet. Who knows? Or one solar system. I don't know. But how do we even know? <laughs> and, you know, how do you start there? You know, because there's so many possibilities. Yeah, so you're right. We really don't know if we don't know if there's even a single advanced civilization out there. We don't even know if there's primitive life out there. So I think um, when you have a question like that with some big unknowns, um, I think you do the stuff that's cheapest first. So, you know, we, we, we look at nearby stars, we have spectrum analyzers that are pretty cheap to build. Um, and you look for radio or television or whatever you could do inexpensively. And then you can, you know, add more and more, looking at more and more stars, um, looking at more of the spectrum. And then if you wanna look for primitive life, um, I think that there's a couple of ways to do that. So one possibility is um, to take the spectrum of the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. That's really hard to do right now. You can, uh, it's even hard to just see the light from an extrasolar planet because they're right next to the star. But people are thinking about building a spectrograph. This has been done in its very early that you can break the light from an extrasolar planet up into all the different wavelengths. And then you can figure out what the atmosphere is made of. You know, every molecule emits a different wavelength. And you can see if there's oxygen, which would tell you if there's photosynthesis. So we could detect primitive life just from a ground-based or space-based telescope. Space-based telescope would be better. Uh, and then the other way to look for primitive life would be to go there, you know, like go to Europa or go to Enceladus or go to Titan um, and, uh, that's, that's quite a bit more expensive. That's a, that's a billion dollars a mission. But, you know, NASA's and ESA are thinking about doing that. Yeah, I'm, I was just thinking along the lines, I don't know, there may be life around us in, in and abs just abstract that we're unable to detect or unaware of. For example, let's, you know, we're awake now, but when we go to sleep, we dream. You know, when you're dreaming, it seems real enough. Now, who's to say this is reality and dreamland is not? I mean, obviously we know better, or do we? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I think there could be some new physics that we don't understand, but I don't, I think you just got to do the, you got to use the physics that you know, and uh, you can't, I mean, we, I, I don't think we should just wait for the new big breakthroughs in physics to try to find some other way to communicate. I think there will be, maybe in 100 or 200 years, we'll know a lot of, you know, maybe, Maybe there's something that goes faster than light or something, but I, I think we just, uh, we just do the best we can with the physics that we know. Well, thanks again, fascinating talk. Thanks again, Dan. Okay, thank you guys. All right, um, Jeremy, you wanna take us off YouTube? All right, here we go.